Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about macromolecules. So you should have already watched the video on monomers and polymers and be ready to go and understand what those are. Macromolecules are what we make when we add lots and lots of monomers together and make large, large polymers. So a macromolecule is a very large molecule. And in the body we have four types of macromolecules. We have carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Three of these, the first three of them, are all made from repeating subunits. Lipids aren't exactly made from repeating subunits, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. All right, so let's start with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, this is what your cereal is made of, this is what your french fries are made of, this is what we all watch out for. Be careful of carbs, right? It's because carbohydrates are basically sugar, okay? So in the case of carbohydrates, our monomer, is going to be called a monosaccharide. Mono means one and saccharide means sugar. So the monomer of a carbohydrate is a monosaccharide or a sugar molecule. You can see right here one example of a sugar molecule is glucose. Okay, It's a six carbon ring. If you take two monomers and you put them together you would remove the water molecule and go through a dehydration reaction, hook those two monomers together with a covalent bond, that would be called a dimer. Di means two. So a dimer is the disaccharide. So di means two, saccharide means sugar, that means two sugars, and here you go. Two glucoses hooked together is actually called maltose. Okay. If we were to get take another subunit, another glucose subunit, and add it on the end here, we would then be making a polymer. So remember, more than one or two is going to be a polymer. And remember, these are held together by covalent bonds, and so to break them apart, we have to add this water back in. It's called a hydrolysis reaction, and it will break apart the sugars. So if you are building something in your body, if you are making carbohydrates to store energy, for example, you would go through de dehydration reactions. If you don't have a lot of free energy and you just had lunch, um, you would be breaking down what you just ate via a hydrolysis reaction. You would break these down and either use the glucose to make energy, or if you had more than enough energy, you would store it. So the polymer for a carbohydrate would be called a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many and saccharide meaning sugar. You can actually see here are the individual subunits that are held together with a covalent bond and there can be lots and lots and lots and lots of them in a long chain. Now with carbohydrates sometimes the chains are branched meaning they have little arms coming off of the main chain and sometimes they're not branched. But all of the monomer subunits, the monosaccharides, are held together with covalent bonds. Some examples of carbohydrates would be starch. This is what you're going to find in your baked potato. So lots of starch. That's how plants store some plants store large amounts of carbohydrates. When we eat lots of carbohydrates and we don't use them immediately, we actually store them as glycogen. So we'll be learning more about glycogen later, but that's basically just a way to store sugar in our body if we don't need it immediately. All right, our second macromolecule is proteins. Okay, here the monomer is different. It's not going to be a saccharide, a monosaccharide. Here the monomer is called an amino acid. And there are 20 different ones that, um, that we're going to see in the human body. You can see this is glycine, this is cysteine, this is tyrosine, and this is lysine. And all of them have the same basic structure except for what we call the R group. So we have an amino group on one end. Amino is the NH2. We have a carboxyl group on the other end. We have a hydrogen at the bottom. And then the side chain we have represented by R here. And if you look at what's in the beige box for R, it's quite different between these four amino acids. Now remember there's 20 different amino acids and each one has a slightly different R group. So the monomers are all of these different amino acids. The repeating part is this part here. The unique part is the R group. If you put enough monomers together and you get a polymer, another word for that for proteins is a polypeptide. So the monomer is an amino acid, the polymer is a polypeptide. 
So let's look and see how you would put these two together. We're going to use the same type of reaction. We're going to put two monomers next to one another. We're going to remove a water molecule and it's going to cause a bond between this carbon and this nitrogen. And in the case of proteins, it has a special name. It's called a peptide bond. So it's still a covalent bond, but it has its own very special name. So we can add together two amino acids through dehydration synthesis, and we can actually break the peptide bond by adding water back in and break uh, protein molecules by hydrolysis, break them apart. So proteins are very important in the body, and one of the things that allows proteins to do so many things is that they have very specific shape. So if the protein loses its shape, so if you heat it up or treat it with too many chemicals, you will do something called denaturing the protein, and that's where the shape is disrupted. The protein won't do its job anymore if its shape has been disrupted. This is one of the reasons why if you have a very, very high fever, it can be very dangerous because you might denature or wreck the shape of the proteins in your body. So we have four levels of structure when we talk about folding a protein. So imagine your protein is like a bead necklace. So the number and order of the amino acids is your primary structure. So imagine you have a bead necklace uh, that has a thousand beads on it and you have a certain order. You have a couple of green ones, and then a blue one, and then a red one, and then some more green ones, and then maybe some white beads. The number of beads and the order of the beads is the first level or the primary level of structure in your necklace. Now imagine you start to fold up a part of your necklace, not the whole necklace, but just a part of it. So say maybe this pink part right here starts to fold. Imagine you round it around your finger. The rest of the necklace has not been folded yet. You just have a small local area that you've folded up. So that would be your secondary structure in protein folding. And the secondary structure forms because of interactions, hydrogen bonds, between different parts of the backbone. So you can get either an alpha helix, which sort of looks like a phone cord, or they look kind of like, uh, like a paper fan that you've folded together. That's called a beta pleated sheet. But again, the secondary structure is just a local folding of various parts of the protein. So this might fold into an alpha helix, and this part might fold into a beta pleated sheet. Your tertiary structure is going to be the overall shape of the polypeptide. So you can see here, you've got your pink parts and your purple parts that are all folding in different ways. So this is the sort of globular shape, overall shape of the polypeptide. Imagine you took your bead necklace and you just sort of scrunched it up in your hand and it was all folded. Uh, that would be the tertiary structure. And then some proteins have what we call quaternary structure. Not all of them do. Some of them only make it to tertiary structure. Quaternary structure is when you have a protein that is made out of more than one polypeptide. So you can see here, maybe this polypeptide, or this peptide, is the pink part here. And you actually have four different uh, polypeptides that come together. So for example, hemoglobin is made out of four different um, polypeptides that come together. Now quaternary doesn't always mean that you have to have four. Some proteins are made out of two different subunits. Some proteins are made out of three different polypeptides. Quaternary just means that there's more than one. The lowest level of protein structure that's required for proper functioning of a protein would be right here. Tertiary structure is the lowest level of structure that's required for a protein to work. So even if you had the proper number and order of amino acids, and even if you had these local foldings, unless you can achieve tertiary structure, the protein won't work. So when you denature a protein, you're getting rid of this tertiary structure so the protein doesn't work anymore. Okay, our third macromolecule are nucleic acids. So there's three types of nucleic acids in the body that we're going to talk about. We have DNA, RNA, and ATP. 
And in this case, the monomer is called something different again. Our monomer is our subunit, and the subunit here is called a nucleotide. And the nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar group, this is a sugar right here, and a base which contains nitrogen. So we have five possible bases that could go into this part of the subunit over here. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Now in RNA, instead of thymine, we have uracil. So that gives us our five different nitrogen-containing bases. The polymer for a nucleic acid is obviously a nucleic acid. And the polymer would either be RNA or DNA. Now, DNA is double-stranded, which means it has two backbones. RNA is single-stranded. It only has one backbone. They also have different sugars. We're going to talk a lot more about that uh, later in the course, but for now, uh, suffice to say that the sugar for DNA and RNA is a little bit different, which is why RNA uh, is single-stranded and DNA is double-stranded. To hook together our monomers, here's a monomer right here phosphate sugar base. And here's another monomer right here, phosphate sugar base. Hooking them to, to the two of them together is um, going to be achieved by a dehydration reaction to make a covalent bond. And in case of these covalent bonds, they have another fancy name called a phosphodiester bond, basically because we're hooking together phosphates here instead of just carbons or oxygens. We've got our bases that you would find in DNA right here, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And the base pairing, complementary base pairing, is what holds the two sides of the backbone together. So the phosphate backbone on this side is held together to the phosphate backbone on this side by complementary base pairing between the bases. So A always bonds with T, and G always bonds with C. So they love each other, they're soulmates, and they're always going to want to bind together. And one of the reasons for that is if you look at adenine and thymine, each of them has room for two places for hydrogen bonds. Guanine and cytosine have room for three hydrogen bonds. So guanine isn't going to want to bind with thymine because thymine only has two and guanine has three hydrogen bonds that it can make. So it'll be sort of left hanging. It won't make the right shape. All right, our last nucleic acid, not RNA, not DNA, but ATP is called adenosine triphosphate. So if you look at it, you've got your nitrogen containing base. In this case, it's going to be adenine. We've got our sugar, ribose, here, and then not just one phosphate, but we actually have three phosphates. That's why it's called adenosine triphosphate. Now, these guys are negatively charged, and we've already learned about how things that are negatively charged like things that are positively charged. So if you think about it, if negatively charged things like positively charged things, you can kind of make the assumption that negatively charged things don't really like other negatively charged things. They don't want to be, a, they're not attracted to each other. They don't like each other. And so in order to force these three phosphates together, we have to have really, really, really strong bonds holding them together. This last bond is very, very, very strong, which means it has a lot of energy holding that third phosphate onto the ATP molecule. So what we can do is we can take our ATP molecule a base, adenine, plus a sugar, plus three phosphates, and we can actually allow that last bond, that last phosphate, to be removed from the molecule. Instead of adenosine triphosphate, we now have adenosine diphosphate, ADP, plus we've released some energy. When we re form ATP, we take ADP and we smush another phosphate on the end. So we now have ATP. In order to get that phosphate to fit back onto ADP, we have to invest a lot of energy. So ATP is really a energy storage device. You can store energy in ATP, which can be then transferred to another part of the cell, and that energy can be released to do work in the cell. 
Okay, our last macromolecule are lipids. And these are not made out of repeating subunits. There's three different types of lipids that we're gonna talk about. The first one are called triglycerides. These are fats. Phospholipids is a type of lipid that we see in the plasma membrane. And we also have something called steroids, which are what hormones and cholesterol are made out of. So triglycerides. Triglycerides made by dehydration synthesis. We're going to take a glycerol molecule, which is a sugar, and we're going to add three fatty acids to it. When we take away our water molecule here, here, and here via a dehydration molecule, we're going to end up with something that has a head and three fatty acid tails. This is a fat. We call it triglyceride because we have three tails. Now our phospholipids are also not made out of repeating subunits. Our phospholipids only have two tails on them. So we have a head group here, and then we have two um, fatty acid tails to it. And our steroids look very, very different. Our steroids have this sort of ring structure, and um, so they've got the four rings, and we use steroids to make cholesterol and hormones, including our sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen. Okay, here is your review. So we have our four macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. We have examples of those macromolecules. We have what the monomer is. Glucose is the monomer for carbohydrates. Amino acids are the monomer for proteins. And nucleotides are the monomer for nucleic acids. Again, lipids aren't really made out of monomers because these guys aren't exactly repeating. However, they are made up of subunits. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.